Good morning. As, as was said, um, my name is John Ashbury. I'm the executive director of the DART Center. DART is a national network of 31 justice ministry organizations, of which the Brad organization here in Columbus is one. So I work ostensibly with 600 congregations across uh, of, of many different traditions, across uh, the heart of the Bible Belt, if you will. But this is my home, and so it's good to be with you uh, this morning and to share uh, in this service and thinking about God's word for our time and place. Let us pray. Gracious God, may the uh, words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you as we pause and consider your word, your word of forgiveness in this time and place. Enter our hearts, open our minds, bless our spirits with your presence, with your wisdom, with your grace. In your name we pray. Amen. The preaching theme, which we were all asked to think about uh, for Lent, is forgiveness. And forgiveness is complicated. I'm, I'm making bread today, and my bread recipe is forgiving, which means that I don't have to do everything in precisely the right order. Two people bump into each other in the grocery store. Really, it's nobody's fault, but you might say, forgive me. On the other hand, you might do something horrific to a friend or family member and you'll have to beg their forgiveness. You might screw up on something just in, your, in a project for yourself, and you have to beg yourself for forgiveness. There are lots of layers. It is inter, intrapersonal. It is interpersonal. It's forgiveness is social. It's national. It's global. Forgiveness is complicated. Most of the dictionary definitions focus on things that are personal. Uh, either to let go of resentment or to give up a claim to requital. And every now and again, at the very end of those dictionary definitions, they have to throw in something about debt forgiveness, which is another sermon and a really important one. Forgiveness is complicated. So, so but for this morning, I want to invite you to look at this passage from Exodus, chapter 17, to help us think about some other nuances for forgiveness. The Hebrews have just escaped, been released from slavery in Egypt. They are journeying in the Sinai. And at Rephidim, they camped, but there was no water. They were thirsty. We need water to live. Did they dig a well to find water? No. no. Did they send out a search party to scour the area to find more water? No. Did they get together with Moses and, and confront the situation and think about what are we going to do to deal with this water crisis? No. They complained. They quarreled with Moses and by extension with God. Now remember, this is chapter 17, just in the last chapter, so think a couple weeks ago, they had a different crisis. They didn't have any bread or food, so God provided manna. God provided quail. Like that's in, they should have remembered that. It just happened but they've already forgotten it. They've forgotten a lot of things. They have forgotten that they were slaves in Egypt. They have forgotten the manna. They have forgotten the quail. They had forgotten uh, uh, parting of the Red Sea. They had forgotten um, the 10 plagues. And what they do remember, they remember wrong. In chapter 17, they remember a time when they sat by the flesh pots of Egypt and ate bread to their fill. That didn't happen. That's an invented memory. 
The oppression of, of slavery for the Hebrews in Egypt was brutal. I mean, and that's backed up by the historical record, like the archaeology historical record. But in the Bible, it tells us that the Hebrews groaned under the impression of Pharaoh, and that's what kicked off this God's liberation project. And, and because the Hebrews were growing so numerous, Pharaoh ordered the midwives to kill all the firstborn males. And when Moses asked Pharaoh if the, if the Hebrew slaves could have a day to worship God, Pharaoh not only said no, he doubled the workload and tell them they should make bricks without straw. That was slavery in Egypt. There were no flesh pots. That's an invented memory. You see, the, the Hebrews are really struggling with how do you really get out of slavery? Rabbis in the Middle Ages asked this question because it's not that long. It takes 40 years for them to wander through Sinai. It's not that long. Going from Egypt to the Promised Land shouldn't have taken 40 years. So, so some rabbis asked themselves, why did it take 40 years? And I, don't, I can't read the original Hebrew, but I'm told it says that, that while you can take of the Hebrews out of slavery, it would take a generation to get slavery out of the he Hebrews. And so the Israelites had forgotten all of this, and they start to grumble and complain to Moses about God. So in this story, who really has a beef? Who deserves forgiveness? Well, when I read this story and I think about the context, like in the grumbling, Moses owes an apology from the Israelites. God is owed an apology from the Israelites. But that's not what happens, actually. Uh, God forgives and gives the water. Forgiveness is complicated. God knows that the Hebrews have been in bondage. They've internalized the slavery. They've grown used to the story that Pharaoh is in control. They've grown used to the story of scarcity. There isn't enough. Therefore, we have to turn to Pharaoh uh, to provide. Uh, they've internalized the story that the world is scary. We need Pharaoh to protect us. They've internalized the story that that's just how the world is. It's the story of despair. And we need Pharaoh to take care of it. That's what's in the back of their minds. And there's a temptation to go back to slavery and to forget their liberation. And actually, as you study the Torah, that, that, and, and, and even to this day, if you participate in a Passover service with a Jewish family, all throughout the ceremony and in the Torah, the injunction is remember that you, first person, plural, present tense, were slaves, well not present tense, but applying to you, were, were slaves in the land of Egypt. It is personal. The memory is personal. Remember where you came from. And the way out the way to freedom is to go forward and embrace the promise of the promised land. That there will be enough when we get there. That, that, we, um, that there will be hope. That there's promise and there's strength in our community. That's the promise. But what does that have to do with us? We're wearing our Sunday best. We're in a fine sanctuary. We're pretty well off materially, right? And we're not in any kind of wilderness, are we? Are we? Are we? 
I don't know. When I think about the crushing debt, there's an article in the dispatch today about medical debt, about medical debt, about credit card debt, about student loan debt. I mean, there are 20-year-olds that I know who can't start a family because they have to work 60 or 80 hours a week in jobs that they don't care about. That's a kind of slavery. That's a kind of bondage. When I think about, when I talk to people that are experiencing and or treating rising uh, anxiety, depression, suicide, despair, and people that are trapped in those feelings, and, and I don't want to be misunderstood. I mean, when people are, are experiencing anxiety and depression, they should seek the help of the mental health professionals and therapy and medication, if that's appropriate, and treatment. But we can't ignore that this is a social problem. It's not a medical problem. There's something going on in our society which is creating this epidemic of mental health. Mental illness is political. And if you're buying a house, or if you have kids that are buying a house, or grandkids that are buying a house, I don't know about you, but I'm worried about being, them being trapped in a houses that are overpriced with interest rates that are through the roof, at least compared to what they were 10, 15 years ago. And then, on top of that, you've got climate change, you've got political polarization. Are you sure that we're not wandering in the wilderness? Forgiveness is complicated. And like the Israelites, the way forward, the way to real forgiveness and redemption and release is forward leaning into the stories of abundance, hope, and promise. Don't buy into the stories of Pharaoh that, that only those in charge can protect you, that there isn't enough to go around, we have to be grateful for what we got, um, that, that somebody's going to somebody wants the story of fear that somebody wants to take your stuff and they're coming after it and therefore you have to live in a walled off world don't believe in the story of despair that there's nothing you can do about it our salvation is not in Pharaoh our salvation is with God and to lean into God's story and that and forgiveness is complicated you have to remember where you came from and to whom you belong. Now there are lots of ways to lean into those stories of abundance, hope, and promise. Lots of ways to do that. The one way I know is by joining together with other people of faith, not by trying to do it alone. And on April 25th, I got the day wrong earlier, at the Celeste Center there will be a Nehemiah action and it'll be 40-some congregations, 40-some uh, congregations of different people of faith, different traditions, coming together to stand for the stories of abundance, hope, and promise. You know, it's real easy to feel despair about climate change. But on that night, people of faith will be challenging city, the city council to take concrete steps to protect the tree canopy in Columbus, Ohio, which is a very basic environmental need for our community. And that night, even though the story of fear is always at the door, 2021 was the deadliest year in the city of Columbus, and Bread and, and the faith community of Bread challenged the city to adopt proven um, strategies to reduce gun violence. 
and it's down a little bit, but it hasn't stunk in, sunk in. The patterns of policing that are well established that promote this violent crime in our communities need to be undone and sustained over time. So come out on April 24th and witness to the story of hope. And then the organization will be challenging the county commissioners to invest money in affordable housing. You know, we've got enough money to build a house for the Columbus crew. I watched the game last night, but I think if we've got enough money to, to, to build a soccer stadium, we probably have enough money to house working families. When we witness, when we join with others to witness to God's story of abundance, hope, and promise, there is potential to find forgiveness, redemption, and a way out of the wilderness. We will find freedom. It's actually not that complicated, and it is. Uh, see you on April 25th, and see you as you live into the God story of abundance, hope, and promise. Thanks be to God. Amen.